Uh, Mallory already gave me an introduction. Um, if you haven't checked it out before, check out on stonerblog.com. Uh, and also, you can tweet at me at the Doug Co. Um, that's also my direct line. So if you have any questions about uh, responsive or things that you see today, uh, feel free to give me a dial and we can talk about it on the phone. That is the hashtag for the presentation. Um, if you're tweeting along, if you want to be a part of the back channel, that's the uh, hashtag to use. Um, what we're going to cover today is basically uh, four topics. Um, we at MStoner have been do doing a ton of responsive relaunches and even a couple of responsive uh, retrofitting projects. So what we wanted to do is share uh, some of the lessons that we've learned so far. Um, we're going to talk specifically about responsive retrofitting. So people who uh, have a site maybe that they went live with in the last couple of years and don't have a need to necessarily go through a full site relaunch again, but do have a need to address uh, basically the way a site is structured and appears on multiple devices. Um, three is that we're going to talk to uh, one of my good friends and colleagues, uh, Eric Runyon, uh, as I like to call him the rock star of responsive and higher ed. Uh, and then finally, we'll do a Q&A session. So that's pretty much it. Um, I also have a little bit of time for a, a prologue here. And this is a way of thinking about uh, responsive design in a bigger context. And I think that that's important um, for many of us who have worked in the web for many years. Uh, myself, I think I'm about 15 years in on uh, web work. Um, it's kind of important to step back from the maze and uh, look at you know, what's happening and what this is a, a piece of. Um, so what I did was I pulled a couple of, uh, of examples of, you know, the way computing has developed over the years. Um, we kind of harken back to 1954 with the first uh, commercially available mainframe. Uh, the IBM 6150 uh, went, went on the market at a value of $200,000 to $400,000, uh, basically less, less powerful than a, a handheld calculator is now. Um, you know, about 20, within about 20 years, we were in a much more affordable price range uh, at about $17,000 uh, for, you know, some of the first uh, portable computers or personal computers. Uh, and this was the uh, IBM 5100s, uh, uh, their first portable computer. Um, I think it was pretty much designed for the guy that you see in the advertisement there. Uh, I think he's an accountant or maybe a, a CEO. Things started to get a little bit cheaper after that, a little more rapidly. Um, and I like this example, the HP 150, because it's actually a, uh, an example of how touchscreen computing has been around uh, long before smartphones. So back in 83, um, we were now in the kind of a 3K price range where it starts to become affordable for uh, families, still way more expensive than you would pay for a, a desktop or a laptop computer today. Um, one, one of the first kind of um, web-connected phones was the IBM Simon back in 1993. Um, so many people uh, were sort of still dabbling with email at that point, but this was the first phone that had uh, geolocation services and uh, email, and it went on the market at about uh, $900. Uh, $900. Uh, so where are we now, 2012? Um, we have an iPhone, which can do about 10 times more than that first uh, uh, mainframe that I showed, and we're at about a, a $200 price point for it. Um, and where we're headed, you know, with Google Glass, if you guys haven't seen it, is towards wearable computers that are also connected to the web. So computers that allow you to view information in context of where you are, whether that's uh, temperatures, uh, sharing media, sharing the views or the videos that you're seeing, uh, or even looking at public transit and seeing, you know, when is the next train going to arrive or is this particular subway station closed? Uh, we also have um, things like Nest. This is the Nest thermostat. It's, uh, it's two pieces of product. The one is the thermostat that you actually install in your home. Uh, and the second is the, uh, the app that goes on your uh, smartphone. And basically, the genius of this is that the app begins to learn what your temperature preferences are. It also auto-adjusts when you're not around. So it begins to learn when you're in your house automatically based on geolocation. Uh, and it's going to basically turn your heat off when you're not there, your air conditioning off. And when you're on the way home, the Nest begins to uh, you know, prepare the, the temperature to your own preferences. 
So uh, a web-connected device, a product that spans hardware and software, uh, and something that's um, basically uh, pervasive and, and part of your living experience. So the, the bigger picture here, the, the, the sort of strategy is that we're headed towards a future where the web is ubiquitous and portable everyday uh, devices. Uh, and so we're, we're using responsive as a piece of that to start building for this reality now. Um, this, this means, you know, in the, in the context of higher ed marketing, making sure that the sites that we deploy are, uh, are optimal on all devices, including smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. Um, and, and really to get to the core definition of it, uh, responsive design is an approach to design and development that ensures a site displays optimally on a variety of devices, including mobile. Uh, and so this is, this is sort of the conclusion of this first section where we think about responsive design as part of a bigger trend toward a context-aware web. You know, we have screen readers that sort of address context on the software level. Uh, for somebody who is vision impaired, uh, they can use a screen reader and it's sort of creating a context for the web where they can uh, get to the content and it's addressing it on, uh, on a software level. We have device level uh, context-aware web with the Internet of Things. So that's pieces like the NAS thermostat, um, the, the computers that are being installed in cars, the, the infamous uh, Internet refrigerator, or geolocation services. A popular one in higher ed is Scavenger. Um, we have browser-level uh, context awareness. So with responsive design and development, we're saying we're going to set up the site in a way where the um, the context awareness is happening at the browser level. And then we finally have uh, something that's very closely related to, um, to browser level awareness, which is basically making it context aware at the server level. So using user agent detection and employing a technique called res that we'll ask Eric to talk a little bit about later in the presentation um, for the server to say, I can see that you're on a mobile device and I'm not going to deploy a huge image or a huge video to that. I'm going to prepare an experience that's tailored for you, that's uh, been modified. So I think I think that for me is uh, how I think about responsive. It's a piece of a context-aware web, and really this is something that's kind of happening across the board. And it's easy to get really caught up in uh, the jargon or the um, ideas attached solely to responsive. But the important thing is that um, we're uh, we're engaged in a practice that is deploying content to people in an optimal way, uh, regardless of what kind of browser they're on. So what, what have we learned so far? Um, at M Stoner, we're kind of up to our neck in, in responsive work. Um, these are clients where we have responsive projects underway currently. Uh, UC Hastings, Webster, Drake, uh, Miami University, Whittier College, Spring Arbor University, Herzing, uh, and St. Joseph's College. Um, and I think that the thing that was most telling for me over the course of the past year with Responsive is um, it, it came on so quickly. Uh, and it's the only product offering that I can think of in the history of the business that has a 100% success rate. So every single client that we have put a Responsive line item into the proposal has said yes to it. And to me, that's uh, in indicative that we're really on to something or that this is really a pivotal uh, shift in the way that web development and web design is happening is it really isn't something that needs to be sold. You simply mention it and people are like, yes, of course we want our website to work on multiple devices. Um, and and it, it's just something that makes so much sense and um, that, that I think there's really no, there's nearly no argument against it. Um, so the first lesson um, that, I, that I've learned about responsive is that the need to address devices is great. We, we kind of touched on that in the prologue a little bit, but here are some statistics about the way that uh, device traffic is developing uh, in 2012. Um, so 2012 for Facebook, 55% of the monthly uh, active user base, uh, they access Facebook on a mobile device. Um, there's also something new, uh, Google, Google Research came out with um, uh, on the 14th of this month. Um, this is something called sequential browsing. And this is the idea that people begin a task on one device, most commonly a smartphone, and finish it on another. Um, the, the kind of commonplace example of this is uh, shopping tasks. So where somebody will begin on a smartphone, 
uh, look up prices or look up a product uh, and then essentially finish it later either on a tablet or a desktop. Um, so the fact that 90% of consumers are actually in the U.S. are, are doing this I think is a really telling uh, moment in internet history where we're no longer uh, interfacing with the internet on, on simply one device. It's happening on uh, multiple devices on many different kinds of devices. Uh, mobile and tablet traffic is predicted to out, outpace desktop traffic by 2015 or sooner. So that's, uh, that's both mobile and tablet versus desktop. Uh, and then finally, when we look at developing nations like India or China, what we're seeing is the emergence of a mobile-only contingent. And that's got something to do with the price point of where smartphones uh, currently are. So you think about that $200 uh, price point versus a, a reasonable desktop, which is going to be $1,000 to $2,000. Um, and in developing nations, people can't necessarily afford or, or don't necessarily want to pay out uh, one or two k for a computer, but they're willing to pay out uh, one or two hundred dollars for um, for a internet connected phone, um, and I think that you know based on the way that um, global economy is going, it's really important to kind of pay attention to this as we see China and India in particular have mobile statistics that really don't correspond to any other nation. Um, so here's here's the thing that's a bit of an uh, uh, an outlier and and when you look at all that different kind of mobile traffic across uh, social media across um, US statistics across global statistics why is higher ed the outlier um, many of our clients um, we get uh, access to their analytics and what we've noticed is that only about 10 to 15 percent typically of their traffic comes from mobile uh, OSPs so you know we've, we've been asking ourselves why is higher ed so much lower um, and I think that the answer to that question is, uh, is a theory, um, but it's part of the lesson that I've learned is that higher ed is really behind. Um, and, and here's my theory. The theory is um, if you don't have mobile solutions deployed, people quickly learn not to visit your site on, on a mobile device. Um, so the first part of that statistic is really uh, goes back to the MDOTs, the custom mobile sites that were sort of commonplace uh, in the last couple of years. Um, Dave Olson, many of you probably know him, his, bl his blog is linked in the uh, lower part of the slide. Um, in early 2011, uh, .edu mobile traffic was low, but only 9% of institutions even had a mobile site. So, um, you know, you think of a prospective student, you think of how they are going to look at 10 or 15 uh, different sites during the course of their investigative process. If only one in ten actually has a mobile site, what a prospective student is quickly going to learn uh, is not to visit college and university sites on a mobile device because they're they're not optimized for mobile. Uh, part two of this is is the responsive fork. Um, so let's think about the .edu sites that have successfully deployed a responsive homepage. Um, this is a nice example. This is not one we worked on, but it's uh, UC San Diego, really nice uh, responsive homepage if you want to check it out. Um, this is uh, Eric Runyon's list of responsive.edu homepages. Um, and again, in the slide, uh, in the PDF we, we post, we'll have live links. Um, and what you'll see is uh, there's really only about 24 documented cases currently of responsive homepages, only 24. Um, this doesn't count research arms, uh, libraries, museums, and department-level pages. So, you know, not count, we're not counting uh, places like Carleton, um, where they've successfully deployed several internal um, uh, responsive projects. Uh, it's only home pages. Uh, but, the, but the point is that the home page is the broadest funnel. The home page is where you're going to have the broadest number of audiences, prospective students, current students, current graduate students, um, parents, um, you know, young alumni, old alumni, faculty, staff. It's, it's, the, the, it's the widest funnel. And out of uh, nearly 4,600 accredited degree-granting institutions in the United States, only 24 documented responsive homepages are out there. And some of those are, are even UK institutions. So the number would jump down to something like 19 if we didn't count uh, the UK and the Scottish uh, institutions that have successfully uh, deployed responsive homepages. Um, so if we haven't built for devices, it, it should really come to us as no surprise that .edu device traffic is low. And, and that's the, the theory again, is that 
um, people quickly learn by going to a .edu site that isn't optimized for mobile um, that they shouldn't go back to it on a mobile device. You know, that, that's the takeaway. They go to it, it's not a good experience, they have to zoom in and out using their fingers. Um, it's not the same thing as going to the gap.com or target.com where you get a very tailored, uh, very contained, uh, very optimized mobile experience. Um, so, you know, another theory as to why this, or theories as to why this uh, isn't more widespread in .edu, um, and these are anecdotes from, from clients, you know, most commonly resources. So people are too thinly strapped to be able to fit in a responsive relaunch or a responsive retrofit. Uh, budget is another thing that we, we hear often. So it's a great idea, we just can't afford to do it until uh, 2014. Um, I think scale is kind of a persistent problem in higher education. So, you know, you take a look at a list of part and you notice a lot of the uh, buzz is around uh, smaller self-contained sites, sites that are often 20 to 50 pages. A typical .edu has about 5,500 active pages um, and we're talking about a, a kind of scale that really is daunting for thinking about rolling out something like responsive. Uh, four is um, slower dysfunctional decision making. So we can't implement this without clearing it with blank, and unfortunately we don't have a great relationship with him, her, or them. Uh, and then finally, bad negotiations. So this is one that we hear a lot. We licensed X back in 2011 and we're locked in for at least one more year. Um, you know, I, I think that these are all uh, legitimate reasons as to why, um, you know, why, why innovation doesn't happen more quickly in higher ed, and these are just some of the, the anecdotes that we've heard from our own uh, clients. Um, so the third uh, big takeaway from working on these responsive projects is that it really changes everything about uh, the way that we work as designers and developers. Um, it changes the way that we plan, uh, you know, in other words, wireframes and prototyping. Um, it changes the way that we design. We have to think about flexible elements and we have to think about a mobile first methodology. Uh, three is that it changes the development uh, uh, practice and it makes things more complicated because suddenly we're thinking about uh, user agent detection conditionals, we're thinking about res and server side includes, and we're thinking about touch interface elements. Um, four is that we're having to change our quality assurance process. So essentially um, we have to get to a place where we are um, proofing these on multiple devices using something like Adobe Shadow or uh, a similar product. Um, User testing is something that we're still working on as a firm. Um, what we've tried to do so far with Responsive is segment our typical user tests into two categories. One where we're testing users on desktops or tablets, and one where we're testing uh, users on mobile devices. So trying to modify our testing practice, but I don't think we've gotten to something truly three-dimensional. What, um, what we've been able to get to is just modifying things slightly to try to, try to begin to address uh, device fragmentation. Uh, and then finally, um, it changes time and cost. Um, so adding all of these uh, previous things changes the time that you need to put into a site, even if it's just a department level site or a magazine site, uh, and it changes the cost because you increase the amount of time you spend on it, you need to, to charge a little bit more, particularly if you're an institution that does charge back. Um, so that, that really, um, you know, looking at the broad view, I would say that the, the step that most often, often seems to get skipped in responsive is the planning phase. So um, a lot of the pioneering that's happened in uh, responsive has been at the hands of developers, um, and developers are amazing people who love to dive in and get their hands dirty and, and go at it right away. But, you know, most often I think the, the, the a part of this that kind of gets a short, short shift is the, uh, is the planning phase. Um, and we've discovered that it's just critically important to do good planning when it comes to responsive, particularly because of um, the, the distinction between uh, the experiences that you see on the left here and the mobile experience. So um, when we're working with a desktop or a lap laptop or a tablet, a lot of the conventions remain similar. You know, a tablet does have some difference when you start to think about uh, touch input but when you go to a, a mobile device, you're really playing in a different arena. You're dealing with about a quarter or less of the real estate that you have even on a small laptop. And so nearly all of the design conventions have to change. Um, and I think that that's uh, something that's worth thinking about uh, kind of repeatedly is that 
mobile is really a, a, its own ballpark in terms of the conventions of, of design that have to be applied. Um, so here's a few ways that we've been able to adjust planning um, as we've uh, kind of waded into responses. Um, we've tried several different uh, planning uh, components, and I also have a few here that we haven't yet tried that I'm going to uh, demonstrate for you. But the first uh, way that we saw to address this was full wireframes for each breakpoint. Um, so we, we kind of started off with this method saying, we really need to show clients in great detail exactly how their site is going to collapse you know, at, at key breakpoints. And I think that you know, full wireframes is the most thorough method. Um, another positive to it is that no page element is left unexplored. You don't get to that mobile breakpoint and go, oh gosh, what are we going to do with the footer? Or how are we going to collapse the audience base now? The, the full wireframing process really kind of requires that you think about all those different elements. Um, this also may be the best solution for responsive retrofitting because it provides the most detail about templates that already exist. So if you're working for a, a .edu, um, a university or college, and you're thinking about retrofitting your site, um, you're dealing with a bunch of existing as assets already. And so doing full wireframes would really allow you to plan uh, in great deal detail for all of the assets and how they're going to stack and collapse as you go to smaller displays. I think the cons to this method, uh, there's a few. Um, first of all, it takes the longest. So you're going from one wireframe to three or four, depending on the number of breakpoints that you show. Um, in some cases, we've noticed wireframes don't pre preclude the group from changing their mind later, which essentially is throwaway work. Um, and this also is, if you have a, a group that is particularly slow in decision making, um, we're talking about new deliverables. So this could create a possibility of slowing a project down further than you think it, it should be. Um, number two is um, a method called responsive block prototypes. Um, and this is something that you may have seen uh, out there. This is kind of a method that uh, many developers have used to address uh, uh, prototyping. So this is uh, a lot less specific than a wireframe. You think about a wireframe looking something like that versus a, a block prototype uh, being very uh, nonspecific about how uh, certain things look. Um, the, the beauty of this is it's really fast to de deploy. Uh, it leaves a lot of room for a designer and developer to make decisions later. Um, and it really doesn't promise uh, too much about how certain things are going to work beyond simply showing stack order. Um, the cons of the responsive block method that we've seen are um, it, there's a, a level of abstraction here where you sort of have to look at one and go, okay, one is the logo, uh, two is the search box. Um, so for a layperson who doesn't want to kind of sit down and look at a legend, um, this is probably the most difficult method for a layperson to decode. Um, it does not, it may not preclude the need for full wireframes. So in other words, um, if you're dealing with a, a, a committee that uh, where many people are not web savvy, um, they may still ask you to see wireframes uh, if you show them block prototypes. Um, and then a, the third point is similar to the previous one with a very hands-on group. Um, this may save time at the beginning only to delay the project at the end when the details actually become visible and they say, I don't like the way the menu looks, or I don't like the way that that particular element collapses or disappears. Um, so really, um, one method that seems to be emerging with our responsive practice as, as um, really helpful is something that's sort of a midpoint between those two. So um, I mentioned that we kind of started with the, the full wireframe suite that this is the block prototyping is sort of a widely accepted method of, of um, doing responsive prototypes. Um, and what we've been working with lately is um, just what we call a standard responsive prototype, um, where you have more detail than a wireframe, but le or more detail than a block prototype, but less detail than a wireframe. Um, and so what this uh, method seems to do um, is it seems to combine some of the best properties of a, of a, a block prototype and a full wireframe. Um, and it gets pretty specific about repositioning and content without promising every detail. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you look at this example, you'll see that um, between the tablet and desktop, you can see a demo of how the typography uh, relocates to the side of the image in the tablet view. So it's way more specific than the block prototype um, without, being, without including every detail like a wireframe. 
Um, and again, I think the con of this method is that it may not preclude the need for more detailed wireframes to, to actually demonstrate each individual element on the page. Uh, but by and large, we've found this one to be um, a, fairly, a fairly good kind of Goldilocks solution. Uh, and, you know, this may, be, may have been too specific, this may have been too vague, and this seems to be uh, kind of a sweet spot in between the two typing methods. Um, there's another prototyping method that we haven't tried a lot of called style tiles, and the source is listed down there at the bottom. Um, this, is, uh, this is a method that's gotten a lot of attention, um, and essentially what you can see here is three style tiles. The style tiles aren't exactly web comps, but what they are is a demonstration of how a masthead might be treated, uh, of how certain finishes might work. By finishes, I mean the gray border and the central design or the, the kind of stars growing across the top and the right-hand one. Um, and it's trying to give clients a sense of the way that design elements are going to come together in a responsive context. So without um, having a, a huge commitment about um, how big a main visual will be, a client can see, oh, this is the typography that we're going to use. This is what headlines are going to look like. This is what buttons are going to look like. Um, I can see that the background will be blue, and that's appealing to me versus the white background. Um, and I can also see a basic color palette for each one. Um, so, you know, style tiles, uh, check it out. Um, you might find that it fits into your own design process pretty well for, um, you know, for sharing ideas or for sharing kind of a visual hierarchy with your client. Another one that is um, pretty recent is uh, Sparkbox's style prototype, which was actually informed by uh, the style tiles. Um, you can see a write-up uh, of it on the Sparkbox blog. Um, and I've also got a link to the GitHub fork where you can actually download it. The big difference between Sparkbox's method and um, the style tiles method is that style tiles are still Photoshop documents. And you could certainly embed them in a HTML comp. The Sparkbox method um, is actually a GitHub fork where it's a, it's a coded HTML template. There are elements that will resize and stack, but it does a lot of the same things that the style tile does. It gives clients a sense of what a, a headline copy might look like, body copy might look like, icons might look like, um, as well as colors and photo treatments. So um, it's, it's almost like an in-browser context of the, of the more static style tile. Um, a really nice uh, work by the Sparkbox crew. Um, and another, another uh, piece I think that we're going to see used more as we get, get deeply into responsive is showing clients and sharing, uh, sharing with clients responsive patterns. Um, this is a piece that only went live a couple days ago by uh, Brad Frost, who is you know, one of the, the foremost people in responsive design. And essentially uh, what Brad did was he created a little GitHub site um, that collects uh, patterns and resources for responsive. So he has a bunch of links to different GitHub demos that show how elements work in responsive context. He's got you know, patterns for tables, he's got patterns for multi-column text, patterns for navigations, patterns for tabs. And I think that um, you know, as designers and developers, what he's collected here is valuable uh, and being able to, to, to basically show live examples to clients that may be questioning, you know, what, what, uh, what's going to happen to the tables on my site in a responsive context, or how are forms going to work? You can basically pull up uh, Brad Frost collection, pull up an example of a, uh, of a live responsive form, and say it's going to work something like this. Um, so lesson number five in, uh, in the list for me has been remember the fundamentals. Um, I, I spend a lot of time trying to stay current on web design and web development, and what I notice is there are a lot of sites out there that aren't quite responsive. What I mean by that is that um, I always go back to the original text, the responsive web design book by Ethan Marcotte as the source of understanding um, exactly what uh, constitutes a responsive design. And Ethan's definition is pretty clear that there are three elements that must be included in a responsive design. The first is a flexible grid, so page elements that um, are fluid and that uh, expand and collapse in a fluid way. Not just an adaptive design that has three different breakpoints, but between those main breakpoints, um, the design will actually shift and be fluid. 
the reason why a flexible grid is important is that we don't know what the future resolutions are going to look like. We make things flexible so that um, if Apple decides to change their standard resolution a year from now, um, basically we're working with percentages and our design will shift uh, adequately based on the new percentage. Um, conditional images and other media are an important one and this is one that commonly gets left out in uh, designs that are quote unquote responsive. Um, if, you're, if you're trying to be truly responsive, your design must have conditional assets so that you're not trying to download a two megabyte image to a, a tiny smartphone when somebody's on a, a 4S network. Um, and three is uh, media queries. So making sure there's conditional code to actually change items on a page. Um, so according to Ethan, you know, the, the father of responsive design, if, if um, a piece of HTML doesn't have these three things, it's not truly responsive. Um, the, the three advanced fundamentals that I think are quickly becoming a part of the, uh, you might say the rules number four, five, and six to those initial three are uh, user agent detection. So basically deploying code that does take a step to sort of assess what kind of a, um, a browser someone is viewing the site on. Uh, res or server-side conditionals that basically make the decision server-side about whether or not to deploy media or what media to deploy. Some more efficient way of, of basically deploying some of the conditional assets. Uh, and three is advanced, what I'm calling advanced elements. So it is how are you, ad what are you doing as a designer or developer to address things like slideshows, tables, tabs, multi-column type, uh, custom widgets and forms. Um, and, and I think that these three things are essentially going to become a part of the, uh, the sort of initial three things that define a responsive design because in the absence of these three, three things, you really don't have a truly elegant uh, responsive solution. Uh, so next up, we're going to uh, kind of go through a section on responsive retrofitting. Um, we've seen a plethora of requests uh, from prospective clients about basically taking their non-responsive site and, and making it responsive. Um, this is a kind of a new kind of project we're being asked to bid on this year. Um, I started out my investigation of this by actually talking to a few of the big players in, in the CMS industry about what they're doing to adjust, because I figured if we're getting asked about this, the CMS companies must be getting asked about it too. Um, I talked to Piero, the president uh, over at Terminal 4, um, and got some interesting intelligence on uh, what Terminal 4 is doing to adjust uh, their product to, um, to accommodate uh, responses. So the first thing that Piero talked about is how Terminal 4 uses a component model rather than specific page templates. Um, the big difference there is that many C, uh, commercial CMSs or enterprise level CMSs actually use a page template model, where with Terminal 4 you essentially have, uh, you create a page and install components. There aren't different templates to install. Um, and that may be better for fluid layouts. You, you start to think about how um, in response of, you know, oftentimes you're going to have a div that's set to a width of 100 and you want that div to fill whatever available space it's, uh, it's set up in. Two is um, Terminal 4 offers a great inline preview for different device breakpoints. So as you're doing, you're setting up a page or even changing CSS in line, you actually have a preview mode that will uh, show you your code basically at different breakpoints. Um, the third is that uh, Terminal 4 has a beautiful image variant system where um, it can be set up and configured with media queries. So if I upload a two megabyte image, you know, something that's huge and something that's in the background, um, essentially the system can be set, set up and configured to automatically generate some smaller instances of that that I can pair up with media queries that, um, that are intelligent about saying, you know, you're coming to the site on a mobile device and uh, I'm going to serve up a much smaller image. And I think that for an end user, that's a beautiful thing because you don't have to create four different uh, variations of an image. The, the system will do it for you. Um, and four is um, they are still offering custom mobile setups, but they're encouraging their clients to go responsive. So, you know, many, um, many uh, of the enterprise level CMSs offer MDOT solutions or custom mobile solutions. Uh, and Terminal 4 seems to be ushering their clients away from that. Um, I spoke with uh, Omni Update, and they talked a little bit about, um, you know, also having the inline preview 
Um, they have uh, res and media queries configurable for uh, editors. Um, they have um, image variants as well. Um, and they're also talking uh, to clients um, about mobile setups, but they're generally viewing that as a stopgap solution. So it's for people that aren't necessarily ready or prepared to uh, deploy a, a, a fully responsive site yet. The mobile solution is essentially gets you something to serve to um, mobile visitors. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, jump through uh, Drupal, and this is something that I can address um, either on the blog or um, you know, in, in, the, in the question and answer session. I want to make sure that we have adequate time uh, for Eric, so I'm going to jump to the next second. Um, responsive retrofitting is a site relaunch. Um, uh, when a site relaunch isn't needed, but addressing traffic uh, from multiple devices is. Um, this is a term that was originally coined by uh, a developer named uh, Ben Callahan. You can visit the page on github.com. Actually has a really uh, clever bookmarklet that you can install and visit a few sites that reconfigure non-responsive sites uh, as responsive just by uh, pushing a button. So, you know, is encouraging developers to develop CSS um, that retrofits current sites. It's, it's really kind of a, a, an interesting idea. Um, I think that if you're thinking about this for a commercial relaunch, one of our clients, University of Rochester, is asking us to help them with a strategy uh, for a responsive relaunch. What we're thinking about is uh, identifying the three main templates in the site, um, building the prototypes for planning purposes, redoing the, the CSS of the site, and then going to test with that. So just redoing the CSS uh, and, and testing it out in the context of different devices. Um, Adobe Shadow, a great product for syncing up devices and testing in multiple environments at once. Uh, and then finally, going back and implementing those advanced page elements. So things like images, videos, maps, slideshows, tables and lists, and forms. Uh, and then proofing after you've uh, allowed for those. So, so basically starting with your basic CSS styles, doing a level of proofing, then going back to address these, um, these things that are more conditional or may, may require more nuanced code, uh, and, and then testing again. And then step seven is celebrate. You know, particularly if your site has a limited number of templates, as University of Rochester does, um, modifying three, three basic templates is going to change uh, the top 100 visited uh, pages in the site or so. So it's a, a great uh, kind of self-contained way to modify uh, a .edu site to deploy uh, adequately to multiple devices. Um, so apologize for, uh, for being uh, a little bit, uh, losing a little bit of time at the beginning. Want to make sure we have time to spend with my colleague Eric Rockstar Runyon. His Twitter handle is on the slide there. Um, so feel free to follow him or, or comment directly to him. Uh, and we're going to dive uh, right in with uh, a little bit of an intro. Um, Eric is the Manager of Interactive Development at University of Notre Dame. Um, he's responsible, he's the developer behind uh, the beautiful responsive deployment of uh, the nd.edu site, uh, nd.edu's custom mobile site, the nd.edu map, um, nd.edu's game day, which is a, an awesome uh, athletics news site, uh, and then finally has been making a lot of the updates to Conductor, which is the custom uh, Ruby on Rails CMS that uh, Notre Dame uses. Um, so Eric, is that, uh, is that enough of an intro? Yeah, except I was not aware of the, uh, the uh, nickname that you gave me there. All right. <laughs> I, I, uh, you know, I have to improvise. I have to make it entertaining for the audience. All right. Um, so let's, um, let's, the first question that I think would, would be interesting for the audience to know is, uh, goes hand in hand with this visual from your website. Um, you, you have this uh, post you did about uh, res. So I think the first question is, what is res and how did you set it up to work on the Notre Dame site? Well, like you mentioned earlier, REST stands for Responsive Design with Server-Side Components. Um, it was originally coined by Luke Rabluski, um, which is at Luke W on Twitter if you want to follow him. He's a great resource for mobile information. Um, so essentially what it is is you use some sort of detection on the server side to make um, intelligent decisions about what to serve up to the client browser. So in our case, we are using a uh, a library called um, UA Parser, 
and we have a setup to give us back three different um, three different pieces of information about whether it's a mobile device, a tablet, or a desktop. Um, those are the three overall decision breakpoints that we were using for MD.edu. Um, you can go further than that. There's a, a library by Dave Olson of West Virginia called Detector, which also uses UA Parser, um, but it also uses um, uh, a JavaScript library called uh, uh, Modernizer, which will give you back a ton of information about the client browser. Um, you know, all the different capabilities. You could do some really crazy server-side detection that way. But we stuck with something pretty simple so that um, if, if you've been to nd.edu on a desktop browser, um, you'll remember how long the home page is. Um, it has the, the top section there and then all of the four sections that are in the gold bar, the about, academics, admissions, and faith and service, which are all top level pages. Um, if you're on any sub page and clicked on those, you would end up on a, on a sub page. So we made a, the decision fairly early on to not include those on mobile devices simply from a performance standpoint. Uh, we didn't want to load up all of the HTML and images that are included in that. And uh, we, fig we figured that was a, a decent solution because all of those sections would still be readily available to the mobile user by a single click on, on, when you visit on a mobile device. Um, they're actually there right above the quote unquote fold. Um, so the result of that is if you visit on a desktop browser, depending on which feature image loads, you're going to get anywhere between 2.3 and 3.2 megabytes. Um, which is quite hefty, even for a desktop device, but it would be um, completely crazy on a mobile device. So by using REST, we were able to keep that down to around 300 kilobytes, um, which results in a much faster and uh, more pleasurable experience for mobile. Fantastic. Um, so. Eric, how have you approached educating um, clients or colleagues across campus about um, responsive? Well, to be honest, we did not approach it the correct way um, at first. Um, since we've had a long history of supporting mobile in one way or another, going back to probably uh, 2007 or so, um, when responsive came along, we just naturally rolled that into our, our as the new method for supporting mobile. Um, without really discussing it with, uh, with our clients on campus, which uh, bit us fairly early on when a client was previewing their site that had already been built, resized the window and things started moving, uh, which didn't match the 960 pixel wide Photoshop document that they approved. Um, so, you know, after some conversations with them, you know, they understood the, the advantages of responsive, but it really made us realize that um, Yes, we may understand responsive and know that it's you know the next big thing, but we really need to get out and educate our clients as well. So um, the first thing we did is we set up what's called a uh, campus communicators brown bag, which is where we invite all these uh, different people around campus who are involved in web or communications in some way. And we uh, did a presentation on what responsive web design is, why it's important, mobile in general. And um, from then, every single client project um, we approached the uh, uh, we broached the responsive topic very very early in the conversation. Um, we essentially say this is how we build sites, um, and you know we we haven't received any pushback at all. Um, everybody seems pretty excited about it. So since that in, that initial um, uh, talk with campus, we just make sure that we bring it up with every single client conversation that we have. A good idea, and it sounds like the early one was kind of the outlier in terms of uh, getting pushback. You know, yeah, they the just didn't about. understand what was going on, and that was our fault. All right, so Eric, what what's in store? Are you are you planning to deploy? Um, you know, are, are you are you deploying responsive sites across the board now? It sounds like you are. Yeah, every client site that we build. Um, Going back probably, I'd say 12 months or so has been responsive. Um, whether it was done, you know, 960 down or mobile first, you know, that varied. But uh, lately, they've been all mobile first, responsive web design projects, um, and our, our clients couldn't be happier about it. 
Is there anything coming down the pipe that's super cool uh, in terms of Responsa? I mean, that that sounds like a, a very integrative kind of holistic approach. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, if there's anything cool that you would want to share. Um, well, we're going to be uh, building a tour site soon, um, which is going to be uh, doing a lot of uh, geolocation, uh, which we're going to rely on some server-side stuff for that. Um, we're doing a little bit of uh, geolocation on indie.edu right now. If you visit on a mobile device, um, there's a, since we don't do the large feature image on mobile, because it doesn't really fit in that context, um, if you go down farther on a mobile device, you can see tour locations, um, which if you're off campus, you're just going to get two random tour locations. But if you're on campus, you will get the two that are nearest to your location, if, you, if you're willing to share your location with, uh, with our server. Um, so, I mean, going with looking at those sort of things, looking at the capabilities of the devices, the features that are available on a, on a per device basis, I think that's going to be the really exciting things that are going to be happening uh, with responsive, um, really tailoring to the device capabilities. Love it uh, and agree. I think that's a beautiful combination of, um, of geolocation and um, going one step further to understand the context of how somebody's viewing a site. So if they're on campus, maybe they get a, a different kind of information. Um, not not just looking at the fact that they're on mobile, but are you mo are you mobile and are you on campus? Um, so I think that's brilliant. Right, and I would love to be able, to, which we don't have the data available now, but I would love to say, you know, if someone is on campus and they decide to interact with us in that way, um, not only show them things that are nearby to show them events that are going on nearby. Um, you know, try to get them engaged in what's going on on campus. I think that would be fantastic. Well, Eric, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we may have had some people uh, dive off right at the 2 o'clock mark if they had meetings, but I think we still have some attendees. So um, if you have a few, if you have any questions for Eric, now would be a time to kind of type those in the window. and. We'll have time for one or two um, before we need to sort of wrap up. Hey guys, that was really great. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, it appears that most of our t attendees are still with us. So we do have a few questions and I'm going to run through them. And as I said on Twitter, we may run maybe five or 10 minutes late. Feel free to dive off if you have to because we are recording this and you can catch this Q&A at the end, but we're hoping you'll stick with us. And just as a reminder, when you do uh, leave this webinar today, you're going to be presented with a really short survey that we would really encourage you to take. It helps us in our planning and it is great feedback for our presenters. So let's go to our first question. Uh, Matt Holmes has asked, um, or he made, he made the point that right-hand navigation has a lot of pluses and it seems like all its negatives are taken care of by responsive design. Any usage of right-hand navigation being discussed in relation to responses? And that's a question for either Eric or Doug. You I know, can't say um, that we've I, done a right-hand navigation in a very long time. Yeah, ahead, I mean, I think um, I, I agree with the, it seems like the, the question also contained an assumption that responsive helps resolve that. Um, and I think that probably what Matt's getting at is, um, it matters less in a mobile context if, if there's left-hand or right-hand navigation because you're going to end up tucking the navigation uh, somewhere else. You're either going to collapse it towards the top of the mobile view or locate it at the bottom, which is another kind of typical pattern for, uh, for mobile views. So um, I, I would say I agree with the basic statement that um, there's maybe a little bit less to, to kind of argue about. But, I, but I'm also with Eric. I think it's been a while since we've um, deployed a right-hand uh, navigation in the site. All right, our next question comes from Eric Olson, and he asks, depending on your in-house talent, what's the hardest thing about responsive web design to do in-house, and the most important thing to outsource? Doug, would you like to take that one? Um, I, I can go first. Um, I, I think that the important part to take in-house is whatever you're great at. Um, I, I think that the, 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 the answer to that is going to vary based on the team. 
Um, if you have a really talented designer in-house, for example, it wouldn't make sense to outsource the design. Um, I, and I would say that the critical piece and probably the one that is the most difficult is, um, to me, the, the, the challenge with responsive, the, there's the most depth to the, to the development side of it. So I think the development side of it, it, it would be the part that I would be uh, most quick to outsource unless you have super talented designers in-house. And the reason kind of goes back to those six fundamentals um, that I mentioned for um, response of the basic three that Ethan outlined uh, are going to be things that most uh, developers can learn or figure out. But it's those, it's those other three when you start to get into um, user agent detection um, into server side includes for conditional media. Um, and into like really thoughtful solutions for page elements that um, um, you're, it's, it's, there's basically a lot of depth to the problem. So I, I guess that's my answer is I don't think there's a catch-all. Um, I think that you have to play to the strengths of the internal team. Um, and I would say that the, the development part of responsive is particularly challenging. So I would really think critically about um, do you have developers, do you have a development staff that's as talented as, you know, Notre Dame's, for example, uh, because I, I don't think that, that many places do. Now, Eric, I have a couple of questions for you. The first comes from uh, one of our attendees asking, do you have a device lab set up at Notre Dame, or are you using tools to test various device configurations? Um, initially, when we're developing, we do the typical resize the browser approach. Um, but we also have um, a small lab in our own in our own department that includes several um, Android tablets and uh, handsets that we just connect to over Wi-Fi. Um, but we're also in the process of building a university device lab. Um, it is not off the ground yet, but the idea is to have. Um, at least a small budget to be able to buy used devices um, that people can go into a lab and check out devices to be able to test. Um, but otherwise, right now, we just use whatever we have in the office with, um, in conjunction with some emulators. And another attendee, Gabe, is wondering, why are on nd.edu the social links at the bottom and does their location change on mobile platforms? Um, no, I mean they're always in the footer but if you visit on a mobile device it's only I think two swipes to get to them, um, at least on the home page. But uh, no, I mean not, I wasn't really in the design process except for um, consulting on how things should function. Uh, for mobile and the rest portion, um, so I couldn't really speak as to the placement of the social icons. And our last question for today, I'm going to ask each of you, Eric and Doug, and maybe Eric, you can respond first. And no answering with your own website. I will. Uh, I will throw that out there. What is your favorite responsive .edu website today? Um, I was actually asked that the other day by someone else, um, so I have a readily available answer. Um, okay. I went through the uh, I went through the uh, responsive um, home pages yesterday, which is actually up to 25 now. And um, from a perf if I had to you know combine everything, performance and the look and um, you know the the download size and everything, um, next ND.edu I have to go with West Virginia. And Dave Olson's team. And Doug, what about you? What's your favorite responsive.edu website? Just, just gonna pull up uh, .edu site so people can see uh, that it is indeed a, a beautiful solution. Um, I, I'm speaking strictly from a, an aesthetic uh, standpoint. Is I really like the Lancaster uh, UK site. Um, I think there's a lot of really thoughtful. Um, there's, there's a lot of thought that went into the design. I'm pulling it up now. Um, and you can just kind of see that um, as you narrow it and collapse it, um, they just really put a lot of work into the, the way that they're addressing the patterns. Um, so it, it's lovely. It's quite lovely on a desktop. It's quite lovely in a mobile view. 
um, and, and I just think the typography is really solid. So I'm speaking less from the development uh, side and a little bit more from the design side on my answer, but um, I think they're, they're both uh, beautiful sites. Awesome. Well, Eric, Doug, thank you so much for taking the time to do this webinar. And everyone, thank you for attending. Uh, as a little teaser, we hope to see you at our September webinar, which will be presented by Fran Zablocki on lifetime engagement management. So we are nailing down that date as we speak, and there will be more details to come soon on the M. Stoner blog. So watch for that. And thanks, everyone. Uh, we hope you have a great day. And please keep tweeting us. Um, and we'll get that recording out to you as soon as possible. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.